Thank you. For many days there was utter destruction in the Egyptian town. During that time, Father's strength improved and he was soon well enough to help around the house. Father! Father! Lemuel came running in a few mornings later. I've just come from the Hebrew marketplace and all the elders say that the frogs are dead. Moses said that he would ask Yahweh to kill the frogs if Pharaoh let us go sacrifice to our God in the wilderness. Pharaoh said he would. So Moses prayed and Yahweh killed all the frogs. We're all going to make sacrifices to Yahweh in the wilderness. Shouts of joy came from the family. At last, real, true freedom, Jara thought happily. I wonder how long it will last. Hurry, children, we must pack and get ready to leave with the rest of the Israelites, father instructed. I'll go find sheep and goats for the sacrifices, father, Lemuel offered. He took care of their animals. I'll help him, Eaton said quietly. Yes, please do, replied father. I'll get the oxen and hook them up to the cart. Raphael, you can help me with that. Yes, sir, Raphael replied readily, his eyes sparkling. Shana, mother called, see to the bread and make sure it's baked. We must have plenty of provisions if we're going into the wilderness. Jara, take Yanni with you and go to the river and get enough water for our family for at least a week. Tirza, I'll need your help packing. Wait, you actually want to come, mother? Tirza asked in amazement. I don't care about worshiping Yahweh, but it will be nice to get out of this infernal heat and go to the mountains, mother said with some exasperation. Now hurry up, get your sandals on. Yes, mother, Tirza replied. Come with me, Yanni. Jara called. I can't hold your hand and this jar, so you'll have to follow along and be good or else you'll be in big trouble when we get home. Yes, Jaja, the little boy replied meekly, wiping his sticky hands on his tunic before rushing off after his sister. All through the streets, everyone was getting ready to go. People were packing up and there was laughter and celebrating. Jara hurried through the crowds of people and tried to keep track of Yanni, who was constantly disappearing in the crowd. Thankfully, the river was not very crowded, and Jara gladly put her pot down on the ground and shook out her aching arms. Phew, she murmured. Clay pots are heavy. Jara was just dipping the jar into the river when she heard a splash. Her eyes jerked towards the sound. Yanni, she cried. He had jumped into the river off of the bank and was now thrashing around in the water that covered his head. Jara threw the pot down and ran into the river. She struggled to wade quickly through the deep water, but finally reached out and grabbed Yanni's hand. She pulled him from the water. Yanni surfaced, gasping for air and clinging to Jara with all of his might. Jara picked Yanni up and held him in her arms as he burst into tears. Jaja, I wet and cold, Yanni wailed. I fall in. Yes, yes, I know, Yanni. Shh, it's okay, Jara said, trying to soothe him, but she was shaking with fear. Jara, is he all right? An alarmed voice exclaimed. Jara looked up to see Ezra sliding down the bank towards where she was standing, waist deep in the water. Amisa stood above them, holding two pitchers. I think he's fine, Jara replied, tremulously. Ezra splashed through the water towards her. Here, let me take him, he offered, peeling Yanni out of her arms. They waded back towards the beach where Amisa was now waiting for them. Ezra clambered up onto the sand, then offered Jara his hand and lifted her from the water. Thanks, Jara murmured gratefully. Jaja, I cold, Yanni sobbed, holding his arms out towards his sister. I'm sorry, Yanni. It's all right, Jara said, taking Yanni back from Ezra. The little boy buried his face in her shoulder, crying. What were you doing here? Ezra asked, concerned and worry, evident in his dark eyes. We were getting water, Jara answered, nodding towards the jar she had dropped on the ground. I thought Yanni was right behind me, and then suddenly he was in the river. Tears were welling up in Jara's eyes. She struggled to blink them back. Here, let's help you back. I'll take the jar for you, Ezra said, picking the jar off of the ground and lowering it into the water. No, really, it's all right. I can get it, Jara insisted. You need to help Yanni. Besides, we live right next to each other. It's not like I'm going out of my way, Ezra stated, lifting the pot. But Amisa can't carry two jars, Jara persisted. No, but I can. Ezra walked over to his little sister and took the full jar from her. Amisa hurried to the water's edge and filled the other. See, now we can all go back together and it's no trouble at all. Let Ezra be helpful, Jara, Amisa said persuasively. Jara looked from Amisa's smiling face to Ezra's tantalizing grin. Very well, she finally assented. It would be hard for me to get back carrying a jar and Yanni, especially since I'm soaked. Thank you, and I'm sorry you got wet, Ezra, Jara finished apologetically. Ezra shrugged, still grinning. It's fine. I don't really mind. It's rather hot today. Jara gave him a shaky grin back as the foursome started up the road. Yanni quickly calmed down and soon asked if he could walk. 
Jara put him down, and Yanni walked next to her, holding her hand. They soon entered the Israelite town and were in a large crowd of people. They tried to thread their way through the maze of carts, animals, and baggage. Suddenly, there were screams and shouts of terror, and the Israelites began to scatter in all directions. What's wrong with everyone? Amisa wondered aloud. Jara looked towards Ezra questioningly. In Ezra's eyes was a look of panic mixed with anger. Twenty or more Egyptian soldiers abruptly came charging through the crowd with their swords drawn. Curls, get back! Ezra shouted. His face was pale, but his eyes kindled with indignation as he gently yet quickly pushed the girls towards the wall of a house and stood in front of them protectively. Yanni was clinging to Jara's leg in fright, and Amisa was grasping her older brother tightly by the arm. Ezra dropped the pitchers in the sand, and his hand flashed to a dagger concealed under his tunic. Jara's eyes grew wide. He could be killed for carrying a dagger. The Israelites were never supposed to have any type of weapons. Where did he get it? Ezra prepared to leap upon an Egyptian soldier who was pushing an Israelite man roughly to his knees. Soldiers were everywhere. Ezra, no, put it back, Amisa whispered frantically. It won't do any good. Put it back. Ezra reluctantly hid the blade but still maintained his protective stance before the girls. One of the soldiers shouted out, Silence! Instantly, silence reigned. Everyone stood in the street as if frozen. Even the animals looked as if they were lifelike statues. The Egyptians shouted out again. What are you doing? There's work to be done. The dead frogs in our part of the land must be put into heaps and then burned. Murmurs of despair and disbelief rose from the crowd. One broad Israelite man stepped forward and exclaimed angrily, We were told that Pharaoh himself said that we could go to the wilderness and sacrifice to our God. That's where we're going. What? The soldier laughed, like we would just let you go. You would surely escape. No, no one is to leave. You're slaves. And we'll do as we command or else. The soldier brandished his sword. But the Pharaoh said we could go, another man chimed in. Then the Pharaoh must have changed his mind. Now get back to work. This land needs to be cleaned up and made to look like it once was. You can't possibly leave now. And if any of you try to leave or sneak out, we'll have to enforce the strictest punishment. The other Egyptians nodded their heads. We will be watching you. All of you, the soldier said mysteriously, pointing his sword at the people circled around him. Then the soldiers all spread out and took up different stations from which to watch the Israelites. For a few moments, everyone just stood where they were in shock and disbelief, but no one dared to raise any more arguments, so they quickly melted away. Ezra sighed and picked up the pictures again. Let's go home, he said dolefully. But Ezra, Amisa began, obviously heartbroken with tears gathering in her eyes. Amisa, Ezra interrupted, we've got to get home. I understand. I'm terribly disappointed, too, but I must get you girls home before we get in trouble. Ezra looked so grown up in that moment. His joyful, yet helpful and optimistic spirit was gone. He seemed so drained of passion and energy that Jara and Amisa obeyed without another word. Yanni, too, seemed completely shaken and clung to Jara's skirt, though he didn't really know what they had just been denied. Moisture clouded Jara's vision as she looked down at the dusty street. She tried to fight back the tears of anger and disappointment. How could the Pharaoh have done this? How could Yahweh have done this? She didn't know. And right then, she didn't care either. She was angry. Really, truly angry. She had walked the street so many times she could probably do it with her eyes shut. She had longed to go into the wilderness and see what it was like beyond this city. And now she couldn't. In fact, she doubted that she would ever go anywhere besides this city. And she also doubted that they would ever be free. Maybe Yahweh really doesn't listen like Mother says, Jara thought bitterly. I thought that he might, but now... Jara's thoughts were interrupted as Amisa entered her family's home and Ezra continued on ahead with Jara to drop off the pitcher of water. As the three of them entered Jara's house, she could see from the expressions of despair on her family members' faces that they had also heard the disappointing news. "'Where would you like this, ma'am?' Ezra asked politely. "'On the table, Ezra,' Mother responded dryly. Ezra laid down his burden, and with a compassionate yet comfortless smile around the room, he turned and walked out the door. Jara suddenly remembered something and ran after him. Ezra! Jara called. Ezra turned around with a curious expression on his face. Yes? He questioned. Thank you for helping me and keeping Yanni and me safe, Jara mumbled shyly. You're welcome, Ezra nodded, a small grin of appreciation spreading across his face. He quickly turned on his heel and walked away, leaving Jara alone in the street. Turning towards home, Jara brushed away the tears and steeled herself for another day of work and more disappointments. 
For the rest of the day, all of the Israelites were employed in cleaning up the dead frogs in the city of Egypt, piling them into heaps to be burned at sundown. The days dragged on. Every night, Jara slumped down on her bed, falling asleep before her head hit the pillow. Every day, she watched with a bleeding heart as her brothers and father came home so weak they could scarcely talk. She wanted to be angry at the Egyptians, but she seemed almost too tired to be angry. She could only dream of the day that she and her family would live on their own in freedom. But it was only a dream, and what Jara was now living in could only be described as a nightmare. One day, Jara was working on cleaning the front courtyard of the Temple of the Sun God, Ra. She had been working all day, alone. Usually Tirza or Shana was with her, but Shana was helping her mother weave some cloth that they were late in delivering to the queen, and Tirza was collecting more straw. They were behind in producing the required amounts of bricks. Again. Tirza's probably already done her work, Jara thought wearily as she cleaned the marble courtyard floor for the fourth time. Every time Jara thought she was done, she found new muddy footprints on the wet floor. She was nearly convinced that a temple guard who was monitoring her work and the work of the other Israelites was playing tricks on her, for she knew that she had cleaned the courtyard thoroughly. As the evening wore on and the expansive courtyard was being cleaned for the fifth time, Jara was so tired that her arms felt like bread dough. She hadn't had a break all day, not even for water, and her shoulders were burning from the heat of the sun and the constant back-and-forth motion her arms were making. It was getting late and she was starting to feel lightheaded from hunger and weariness. There, I'm done, she gasped out as she stood on the now immaculate floor. She looked timidly at the overseer and he nodded his head slightly in approval. That's good enough, he grunted. Don't forget to water the plants. Oh, I forgot about that, Jara thought hopelessly. All the other Israelites who had been working at the temple had been dismissed for the day and the street was almost deserted. I bet my family is worried about me. She told herself as she dragged the dirty, soapy bucket of water to the nearby drainage dish and emptied it. I'd better hurry. As Jara tried to quicken her pace by running back and forth to the well for water, she began to feel dizzy and her vision became blurry, making it hard for her to see. Come on, just one more plant. You can do this. Jara encouraged herself, but as she lifted the plant from the shelf on which it rested, the heavy pot slipped through her fingers. Vainly, Jara tried to catch it, but the pot had already reached the floor and shattered into a million little pieces. Jara stood as if stunned. She had just broken a pot that held in it a plant sacred to the Egyptians, but that was not all she had to worry about. The shadow of the Egyptian guard leaned over her, chilling her to the bone. Jara spun around and began to beg, Please, sir, I really didn't mean to. I just... You were being careless, the angry man bellowed, and you'll pay for your mistake. He pulled out a long leather whip from behind his back, and with a whine, the whip hit her shoulders with tremendous force. Jara was knocked off her feet from the intensity of the blow. At the next strike, she bit her lip hard to keep from screaming. Doubling over under the blows, Jara fell to her stomach and feebly held out her hand in an attempt to stop the overseer. Another and another blow fell upon her shoulders. The pain was terrible, but it was just beginning. When the fifth or sixth blow fell, it ripped open the fabric on her shoulder and tore open her flesh. Jara could no longer hold in her terrified screams. Her body shook from the fierce blows. Her voice shook even more with pain and terror. She soon found that she would faint, but she saw no one who could help her. But maybe if I too faint, she thought between screams, he might stop. Suddenly she heard an angry voice cry out, Stop it! You're going to kill her! Jara turned her head slightly and through tear-filled eyes saw Eaton running towards her, his face aflame with a rage and passion that Jara had never seen before. Where are Father and the mule? Jara thought. Eaton's only going to get himself hurt trying to help me. Aloud she shrieked, Eaton, don't! You'll only get in trouble! Her cry was interrupted by another blow from the whip and Jara finished weakly, Go get help! Eaton, however, only ignored her cries and flung himself onto the Egyptian and tried to wrestle the whip away from him. Jara reached out, grabbed the Egyptian's leg, and tried to pull him down. But the Egyptian kicked her and sent her sliding across the wet floor into the wall. Jara blacked out for a moment. Her vision slowly swam back into focus. Eaton was still struggling with the Egyptian, but even though he was strong, he was no match for the guard's strength. The man was hardly shaken as he threw Eaton off of him and onto the stone floor. Eaton fell hard and lay still. For a moment, Jara felt sick to her stomach. She wanted to do something to help Eaton, but she was too weak to do anything but pray he was all right. Then Eaton moaned. Slowly and painfully, he rose to a sitting position and pushed himself up to his feet, trying to regain his composure. The overseer had an evil grin from ear to ear. He picked up the whip and came back towards Jara. Eaton shouted out, No! and stumbled towards the overseer. 
Without warning, the whip changed its course, and instead of hitting Jara, it curled around Eaton's bare chest like a snake, hissing and jerking. It wrapped around Eaton's body once, and as the end came around again, the overseer caught it in his hand and then pulled the two ends, tightening the coils that surrounded Eaton. The man drew the whip closer and closer in quick, short jerks. Eaton doubled over in pain, struggling to remove the whip from his chest. The whip continued to close tighter and tighter, and soon it was impossible for Eaton to breathe. He grabbed the whip and pulled it as hard as he could, trying to wrench it from the Egyptian's hand. Jara watched helplessly as Eaton's face turned blue, and he gradually lost strength. He collapsed to the ground. Leaning over Eaton's fallen body, the Egyptian continued to pull on the whip. Without warning, Eaton made one last attempt to free himself. He moved quickly and kicked the man in the chest, sending him flying. The Egyptian roared in anger and pain as he hit the wall. He was up in an instant, but in that instant, Eaton had freed himself and was now sitting up, gasping for air. With a menacing yell, the overseer charged. Eaton and jumped on him. There were a few moments of struggle as Eaton somehow managed to block the man's fierce punches. But it was obvious that Eaton was at a disadvantage. In a split second, the Egyptian had knocked Eaton flat on his back and was on top of him, hands around his neck, choking him. Jara had no idea what to do. She couldn't run, but Eaton's life seemed to depend upon her doing something. Then she thought of the one last possibility. Please, Yahweh, if you hear me and ever have heard me, she prayed silently, let this man listen to me and stop. Jara drew up her last ounce of strength and rose to her knees. The movement sent a wave of pain through her body and she almost passed out. But she was now close enough to lay her hand on the overseer's arm. He turned to her with a cruel sneer and Jara spoke, though her voice was no more than a whisper. Please, don't do this. The overseer's face held a mocking grin, but his expression quickly changed when he looked upon the girl and then turned back to the young man. Jara's face was full of pain and sorrow, but yet he saw something else in her eyes. Something that he had never, ever seen before. He saw love in her eyes. Love for her brother and love for him. At that moment, as much as Jara had tried to look back on the Egyptian's mocking grin with anger, she could not help but feel a little sorry for him. All he knows are statues. He doesn't know how to love and he has no one to love him. At least I have my family. Even if we don't always get along. If he knew love... He probably wouldn't be doing this to us. He would love us instead like, like Yahweh loves us. The overseer felt almost overwhelmed with guilt. He looked from this poor, bleeding girl to the suffocating, self-sacrificing boy whose lungs were heaving for air. Eaton's eyes were glazed over as he stared into the man's eyes, pleading, begging for his life. The calloused overseer could take this guilt no longer. He let go of Eaton's neck and slowly stood up, just looking at Jara. Eaton rolled free taking in deep, life-giving breaths. In a few moments, Eaton rose to his knees and looked at the overseer, wondering what would happen next. His sides were still billowing from lack of air, and he looked very weak, but he was still determined to save his sister. But the overseer wasn't brandishing his whip like Eaton had expected. Instead, there were tears in his eyes as he yelled, Go home! and ran away. Eaton was shocked by what had just happened. A low sob from Jara brought him back from his daze. His chest was burning from where the whip had encircled him. He slowly rose to his feet. Every move he made felt like it was draining the life out of him. He was dizzy and lightheaded as he made his way to Jara and knelt at her side. Jara's face was full of pain, and there were tears of pain and love mingling down her cheeks as she whispered, Thank you, Eaton. She wrapped her arms around her brother's neck and laid her head on his shoulder, sobbing. Eaton put his arms around her, being careful to avoid her wounds, and helped her up. He didn't say anything, but as Jara glanced up into his pale face, she saw a comforting smile on his lips. He gently helped Jara to her feet and supported her aching frame as they walked back to their house. Eaton felt the last bit of his strength waning as he struggled to hold up his little sister. When they arrived at their house, Eaton just barely managed to kick the door open and stumble inside the dark room. There were gasps of horror and astonishment from the family members who had been very worried about them. Now the family's fears were confirmed. Eaton, what happened? exclaimed father. Eaton couldn't reply. He only shoved Jara into Lemuel's waiting arms and sank down onto a stool, breathing heavily. Lemuel gently helped Jara to her bed. In a moment, Shana was by Jara's side with some warm water and a washcloth. She slowly peeled away Jara's bloody rags from the wounds the whip had inflicted and laid the warm cloth around Jara's throbbing shoulders. 
Jara couldn't keep back a scream from her lips as the warm cloth was laid on her skin. It stung her shoulders terribly. Jara squeezed her eyelids shut to keep the tears from coming. I must be brave, she thought. Eaton watched Jara's pain, feeling the awful sense of responsibility. His mother touched his shoulder. Are you all right? She questioned softly. She too had a warm cloth in her hand. She nodded towards the burn that the whip had made around his bare chest. I'm fine, Eaton tried to make light of the situation. Let me put this on it, mother commanded. Really, I'm Eaton, his father commanded solemnly. It will be better for you later on. Let mother and Shana examine you. Eaton didn't want the pain the cloth, herbs, and oil would add, but he knew that it would probably be best in the long run. However, as his mother gently rubbed the wound, it seemed to only be burning him and not helping him in the least. He found himself blinking back tears. Once Eaton and Jara's wounds were washed and everyone else was in bed, Father came over to Eaton and demanded to know the whole story. Eaton told it all, with a little hesitation, and also explained that he had been held late at his work as well. If he had not been given another load of bricks to carry, he would have not have heard the pot crash and Jara's screams. As he finished his story, his father was silent. Eaton asked, was I right in doing that, Father? After a slight pause, Father replied, Eaton, you know it isn't right to assault those who are in authority over you. But if, as you say, the beating was for a small fault, I can't see that you were in the wrong in this case, especially from how bad Jara looks. But if she had really done something worthy of punishment, you would have to determine whether or not she was being punished justly or being abused before you stepped in. Do you understand? Eaton nodded. Yes, Father, I understand. Father nodded and then added, I'm very proud of you, my son. If for some reason I were to leave this earth before all of my children were married and the girls have another protector, I would be at peace knowing that I have you as such a faithful son to protect and guide them. Thank you, Father, Eaton replied gratefully. And you know, son, Father continued, I think today more than proved that you are ready and willing to be a protector and a provider. Maybe that conversation with Jaden will happen sooner than you think. He gave Eaton a teasing look. Eaton knew he was blushing as he asked in a quiet, calm tone, Do you really think so? Father nodded and grinned. You're ready, my son. You have my blessing. Eaton couldn't stop smiling. Thank you, father, he said, trying hard to hide the excitement he felt. His father grasped his arm and said, Get some sleep. I know you need it. Jara was in too much pain to sleep. She kept replaying the whole scene in her mind. She couldn't help but think about how Yahweh had arranged for Eaton to be there when she needed protection, and how he had turned her heart and the Egyptian's heart towards him as she had cried out for help. She quietly told herself, I guess Yahweh does answer prayers, though it may not be in our own timing. She silently prayed, Thank you, Yahweh, for protecting Eaton and me. Please keep us safe as we heal, and please let Eaton not be hurt too bad for trying to help me. And also, please help me to learn more about you and to be able to trust in you. I think I want to trust you, but I don't know how. Please, please help me. Amen. Then, with a sweet peace in her heart, Jared also dozed off to sleep.